Good morning. I'm uh, pleased to be here, invited to share some information about, and I like your pronunciation, Aaron, much better than Aaron. Yes. So, just curious, how many of you all have heard of the American Registry for Internet Numbers? How many of you know what Aaron does more than just her? All right. Great. So I'm going to be targeting my questions to those of you who raised your hands. <laughs> oh, no. oh, yes. Okay. So Aaron is often referred to as a regional internet registry. And what is an RIR? And I'm going to throw out lots of acronyms today. So um, throughout, please raise your hand if you have any questions during and after the presentation. So Nancy showed a video today, a little while ago, about the IETF and what they do. And you saw on one of those slides, RFC. An RFC is a request for comment, and it's a standard body. And it was an RFC years ago that created the concept of a regional internet registry. And I raise that just to show you that lots of organizations we talked about today are interrelated and overlap, although we each have our unique um, piece um, to play in the internet. So a regional internet registry manages the allocation of internet number resources, IP addresses, IP internet protocol, IPv4, <laughs> IPv6, and autonomous system numbers. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. So on the internet, we like to say you're nothing but an IP address. So domain names are very easy um, to recall, but behind the domain name is the number or the address, and that is the critical component <coughs> that takes routing and takes information and flows to the internet. So what Aaron as a regional internet registry does is we distribute these addresses in fairly large quantities to organizations like internet service providers who then in turn allocate or assign addresses to their customers. Um, also to end user organizations like universities, hospitals, large corporations that have an internal network that use these addresses internally, not routed externally. But if they need um, fair number of addresses, they will come to Aaron. Okay, so again, an IP address um, is the number, and every cell phone, computer use, needs a unique address to connect to the internet. Um, just a quick history of internet protocol. So IPv4 is the original protocol. Um, it was established in Eduardo mentioned um, ARPANET in the late 1970s with a total of 4 billion IP addresses. When the protocol was developed, no one really knew it was going to go commercial, and certainly no one had any idea of the potential of the internet, that it would become a day-to-day -day, um, use for everybody. Um, this was long before cell phones were even thought of and applications. And today you heard reference to Internet of Things. So certainly back then, no one anticipated we might want to have an IP address so we could turn our oven on from our office or turn down our heat and our thermometer, that sort of thing. So 4 billion addresses seemed like a lot, but um, it's not, and they're about gone. So later on in the 90s, the IETF realized we're probably going to run out of addresses, so the next version, IPv6, was created. And it has been available, and Aaron and other regional internet registries have been allocating IPv6 for a decade. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, just throwing uh, some general information up, and I have, I have a lot of slides, so I'm going to go through this quickly. I just want to give you an overview of a lot of things we're involved with. Um, but IPv4, 32-bit number, 4 billion addresses, 
Um, IPv6 128, so there are two to the 128th power. If you look on the lower right, that's the number of IPv6 unique addresses available to be distributed throughout the world. So folks that are much smarter than me think there'll be plenty um, in our lifetime. You hear that there is an IPv6 address for every grain of sand in the world. Whether that's true, I don't know, but um, certainly we won't run out in my lifetime. And the other um, internet number resource that Aaron and the regional internet registries distribute are autonomous system numbers. Okay. So there are five regional internet registries in the world. The first one, um, Ripen CC, was established in 1992, and it's housed in Amsterdam. It covers Europe and the Middle East. The second regional internet registry, APNIC, is in Brisbane, Australia, established in 1993, and that's Asia, um, primarily Asia. And then Aaron came along in 1997, and when Aaron was formed, Aaron actually covered all of Canada, North America, Central America, South America, and Sub-Saharan Africa. And that was the case until 2002 when LACNIC was formed. And LACNIC now covers Central, South America, Mexico, and parts of the Caribbean. And then in 2005, the last regional internet registry was formed, AFRINIC, to serve the continent of AFRINIC. Um, prior to AFRINIC's formation, the RIPEN CC covered North Africa, and Aaron covered Sub-Saharan Africa. So the original idea back with the RFC was to have regional registries continental in scope. And these were there to serve the local population. Um, they would be better equipped to deal with the needs and also with language and that sort. So all of the regional internet registries are formed in this under the same structure. We're all not for not for profit, nonprofit. And the idea was when IP addresses were split off from domain names, is there is a finite number of these addresses. So they should be guarded under a nonprofit organization with a community bottom-up policy process so that there would be a fair and equal distribution of these addresses based on communities setting the policy. So for instance, organizations with the most amount of money couldn't buy up all of the addresses. So we are all nonprofit, we're all fee for services. Aaron's source, only source of revenue are from our customers who come and receive addresses from us. They pay a fee and it's based on the number of addresses they receive. Um, and it really covers the registration services, um, database. How many of you all know or have used Whois to do a lookup address? So behind that is a database which uh, Aaron maintains in our region and the other regional internet registries maintain. We are, Aaron is a membership organization. Um, any company that receives addresses directly from Aaron is automatically a member. And we have a broad base of members. We have um, public sector, private sector, civil society. And we're all community regulated, and we'll talk more about that um, in a few minutes, but it is you, the community, who come to Aaron, who talk about policy, who actually set the policies under which internet number resources are allocated. So Aaron and I staff do nothing but implement policy set by the community. So we are a multi-stakeholder organization, if you will. You do not have to be an Aaron member to participate. All of our meetings are open. All of our mailing lists are open. Um, and we welcome and want diverse opinions and um, input into the policy process. Uh, we're open and transparent. If you go to the Aaron website, there's a lot of information, but all of our meetings are webcast. 
all of the files are available going back to a third Aaron meeting. Um, minutes of our Board of Trustees meetings are available, so there's a wealth of information. Okay. So um, let's talk about the provisioning. So you heard earlier about IANA, the Internet Assigned Numbers Authority. This function has been going on since the early days, and it actually was started and run by one gentleman, John Postel. Um, back before the regional internet registry system was in place, and he allocated addresses and had a notebook and wrote them down by hand who he assigned them to. He sent letters, uh, <coughs> things were done with a handshake. It was very much a trust one-on-one -on -one relationship. Obviously, that wasn't sustainable, but the IANA function um, has been around since day one, and it's actually a U.S. government contract now held within ICANN. So IANA holds all of the unallocated number resources. Right now there is no more IPv4. All gone except little residual pockets that are coming back. But IANA holds all of the IPv6 addresses that have not been allocated and autonomous system numbers. So Aaron, as a regional internet registry, makes a request to IANA to get a block of resources. We then hold those and customers, ISPs, end users, then following policy request resources from Aaron and we distribute it down. So it's hierarchical from IANA to the regional internet registries to our customers and then to our customers' customers. So this is Aaron's mission statement, and you'll see the segments in blue are really the three fundamental components of what we do. We manage the number of resources, and probably most importantly, we as Aaron, the organization, coordinate the policy development process. And then uh, we do a lot of outreach, um, and we'll talk more about that. The Aaron service region is Canada, United States and its territories, and 22 Caribbean countries. And when LACNIC was formed, the Caribbean was divided up primarily along the lines of Eng most of the English-speaking um, countries went to the Aran region, Spanish to LACNIC, but it wasn't exactly precisely done. So, who is the Aaron community? Um, you all, anyone with an interest in internet number resource management. And that's part of Aaron's mission is to go out, especially within our region, to tell people about what we do, to invite you to participate. And I'll talk more about ways you can do that remotely and invite you to come to some of our meetings. So currently we have a little over 5,200 members, and again, these are primarily internet service providers from within the service region. I think we have 25 members from Puerto Rico now, if I'm correct. But we have many more customers, 20,000. These are organizations, um, universities, hospitals that came for addresses, or an organization that needed one or several autonomous system numbers for networking. We have a professional staff of about 80. We are located in Chantilly, Virginia, very close to Dulles Airport. We have just the one office. And we are governed by a member-elected board of trustees, a member-elected advisory council, and they deal with um, assuring that the policy development process is followed. And then we have a three-person um, number resource organization number council. So this is sort of our tie-in into ICANN. ICANN has what's called um, supporting organizations. There's a domain, there's an address supporting organization. So each of the five regional internet registries elects three representatives to serve on the ICANN address supporting organization. 
um, which is also called the Number Council. So sorry, lots of acronyms, lots of names. But the address supporting organization of ICANN deals with global policy. So whereas Aaron's policy process deals with how Aaron will allocate resources to its community members, the global policy talks about how IANA allocates to the regional internet registries. So it's a small sort of segment of a higher level policy. Um, just to look at our Board of Trustees, we've been very fortunate to have Vint Cerf the past couple of years serving as Chairman of the Board. And if any of you all ever get an opportunity to hear him speak, I encourage you to go. He's quite a gentleman and quite a lot of history. Okay. Um, so Aaron manages number of resources. Um, uh, talked about IP addresses. One of the things we are seeing now and where we're very busy is with the transfer of IPv4 addresses. Aaron ran out of IPv4 addresses last September. There is a growing market for organizations who have IPv4 addresses they're not using, may have um, IP addresses they received prior to Aaron, and we call those legacy addresses. And these addresses are quite sought after and they um, have some monetary value. Aaron doesn't get involved in any of that part of it, but there is a process we have in place for transfers with the goal at the end of the day, what we care about is making sure the database has the correct registration. So people know who's administering what blocks of addresses. Um, Aaron also provides uh, the reverse DNS, the name to number lookup, and our directory services. Um, who is, um, provide a routing registry, and also who was. We now have gone back, so if you wanted to look in the past of who had various um, administration of networks, you can request a report um, called who was. There is no who is going to be. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to take, steal that from you. Um, let's see, sorry. I'm in the wrong way. Uh oh. Okay. So in the area that I'm involved with, um, Aaron, other services and product, we coordinate the policy development process. We do that through community meetings. We have two major meetings a year, typically April, October, um, where all of the policies um, introduced by the community, shepherded through our advisory council, are discussed on the agenda. We have microphones. We um, invite and encourage public discourse, debate, if you will. And then at the end of those discussions, we ask for a show of hands, are you in favor of this policy or not, or ask for suggestions. The advisory council takes that information back. In addition to, we have a public policy mailing list, PPML, open to everybody. Sometimes there is a lot of traffic. If there is a policy that's of particular interest or concern, you'll see a lot of email on that. But those are ways to get input into the process. At the end of the day, the advisory council makes a determination. Does the community seem generally in consensus uh, with the policy? If they do, then the advisory council will recommend that the board of trustees adopt the policy. It'll be adopted and staff will implement. Um, we also um, have the elections which we facilitate and we do a lot of community outreach, education, and training. On the technical side, Erin Online is our customer web portal. Um, we are moving all of our services, requesting resources inside this portal. And we recently brought on, um, had a little surge in engineering to help us catch up and finish building that portal out. In addition, we are working with um, DNSSEC 
DNS security with resource public key infrastructure, RPKI. We have a test environment for folks to use, and we have a community software project repository. Okay, so I want to talk for a minute about the policy development process, because that is a fundamental part of what we do. Um, it is open, transparent, bottom-up. Um, anybody can participate. Our, we have the two meetings a year. We have remote participation. Everything is webcast. There's a live transcript. We have a chat room. So you can um, make your feelings known during the discussion. When we do a call for votes at the end, hands up. People's votes are counted in the chat room. So I encourage you sometime to tune in an air meeting, just get a feel for what it's all about. And if you want to participate, we believe that remote participation um, counts just as much as being there in person. And again, all of the policy discussions are documented and archived on our website. And I think the one big takeaway really is that Aaron, Aaron the organization, does not make policy. You, the community, make the policy. Um, staff implements it. I'm not going to go through this. There's a lot of information on the website about the process. But there is a documented um, process that we as staff have to follow, and before a policy will be implemented, the board checks to make sure all of those steps were met. And this is, um, the document itself on the website is a number resource policy manual. We call it NERPM, excuse that, I had. Um, but these are the types of policies covered, dealing with addresses, autonomous system numbers, uh, transfers, their policies to give micro allocations for experimental things for um, internet exchange points. But every policy, current policy, is found in this document. If you um, are having trouble sleeping at night, I highly recommend you go take a look at that. It won't take long. Um, if you are interested in policy, um, I encourage you to get involved when it can be pretty intense sometimes on the mailing list. So I think these slides will all be available, but these are some shortcuts to tell you how you could monitor them on an infrequent basis and, st and still keep up. And I think going back to policy, the one thing I would say is that it really is um, community-based. And one of the examples I like to use is years ago, um, there was a group um, in the Caribbean who came to an Aaron meeting and said, you know, it's really tough for us small islands, small ISPs to um, meet the criteria to get the smallest address block that Aaron was then allocating. So they brought the issue to a meeting. It was discussed. It turned into a policy proposal. It was brought forth through the process, through the whole Aaron community, and it was passed. And for several years, there was a minimum, smaller minimum allocation for addresses for part of the region. So it was a great illustration how um, if there is an issue by anybody in the community group of people, that you should bring it forth because the process does work. Um, and part of the reason we do outreach um, here and everywhere throughout the region is to let people know that Aaron is a service organization for them and it's incumbent upon you to bring your issues forward and then we can help you work them through the process. So this is part of the um, Aaron's strategic plan for 2016 and I'm going to talk um, just for a few minutes about uh, IPv6. Um, do my little promo, encourage you to take a sticker, um, and talk a little bit about IANA transition. So in September last year, Aaron ran out of IPv4 addresses. Technically, we have some addresses in reserve. The community created some policies that set aside small blocks uh, there's a small block available for organizations to get V4 in order to transition to IPv6. 
We also, from time to time, um, have resources returned before, revoked for non-payment. So we have a little bit, but not much. Okay, so just a quick look at what the plan was. Um, we all know about the success of the internet. Um, four and a half online hours per day. How many of you all are online more than four and a half hours a day? Yeah, that means a little up to you. <laughs> so the original plan back um, in 1995 when IPv6 was developed was to try to find a nice intersect. So IPv6 would be allocated and take off and grow about the same time v4 was running out. So it wasn't working so well, so in 2005, sort of look at the plan, and you see V6 deployment really, really slow, and you see that intersection of the blue and red. So, whoops, we sort of had a catastrophe. Um, we really expected IPv6 to be implemented <coughs> before we ran out of V4. So, today's plan looks a lot like this. Um, the AP NIC region is out of V4 addresses. The right region, um, Europe at least, ran out before Aaron. Aaron's out. LACNIC's addresses are fairly well depleted. AFRONIC is really the only registry with any substance number addresses. And V6 transition has been slow. So there are a lot of statistics out there um, about the growth of V6 or lack thereof, but um, this is one that maybe shows there's promise. Um, so most or a lot of folks are on Facebook as part of their daily use and Facebook is seeing traffic pick up, so there's hope. Um, basically, V4 depletion really affects internet service providers. I don't know if we have any folks here in that group. Um, but there are some alternatives, and the transfer market is one, and there's a wait list of Aaron. There are 300 organizations waiting for address space to be returned. So really, the answer is to adopt V6. Um, some information here about V6, and really from a day-to-day -day user perspective, it doesn't matter so much. You're going to turn your computer on. Um, it's going to work. Most modern laptops are set up um, for V6. It's really a question of whether your internet service provider is providing you V6 transit from your home. Um, if you're an organization, um, you really should think about V6, um, become dual stack running V6. V6 is not backwards compatible with V4. So at a really high level, the issue is new users are coming on over V6, and there's going to be content available there that you're not going to be able to get to over just V4. IPv4, IPv6 will be running simultaneously dual stack for years. Um, it's not going to turn off overnight, but it's time. So what Aaron, as um, a registry providing V6 wants to encourage organizations in general to start thinking about um, enabling your websites over V6. Go to your internet service provider, go to your hosting company, ask about it. And part of it is you want to be on the entire internet. If you're a business um, and if you're selling, you're an online business, you want to be able to reach everybody. So as the internet grows, as new websites come on, new organizations just on IPv6, you want to be able to capture that audience. Um, so dual stack, yes. Um, make your service reachable over IPv6. Aaron's new v6 campaign, we sort of feel like we've saturated the technical community as we're going out to um, all kinds of verticals, enterprises, suggesting they talk to their IT folks to get their website enabled over IPv6. 
helping to drive content. The more content that's there, the more interest there will be from ISPs and others to get on board. Um, same with equipment and software. And your vendors. There is a lot of training available um, for IPv6, free training. Someone here mentioned Hurricane Electric. Um, has a great program if you're you know, a network operator, you're really techie, you want to learn how to set it all up and do it. Um, Aaron has an IPv6 wiki that the community has put a lot of good information about lessons learned, um, case studies. We also recently put up um, a place for vendors to list their services, what's available for web hosters too, so it's, it's a good resource. Um, checklist for enabling your website over v6. I'm going to skip through some of these pretty quickly. So here's a link to the um, Aaron IPv6 wiki. We also have a Team Aaron site, a microsite focused on v6. A lot of um, information, a lot of blogs. We're always looking for guest bloggers who have a topic we think would be of interest to Aaron. So I invite anybody here who's interested to uh, reach out to us. Okay, so switching gears just a little bit. Um, Aaron is involved in internet governance. We're, we are a multi-stakeholder, bottom-up um, organization. We believe that has worked well for the community. Um, the regional internet registries together participate in the internet governance forum. Um, we participate in IPv6. We talk about policy development. Um, we participate through our um, address supporting organization at ICANN. And in particular, you probably heard um, about the globalization of IANA and the transfer U.S. government wanting to give up the IANA <coughs> to a multi-stakeholder um, body. So this transition process has been going on now for a couple years. The current IANA contract expires in September of this year. So back two years ago, um, the U.S. government put these conditions forward for the transfer of IANA, because IANA is a fundamental um, body function of the internet. So the government said, if these conditions are met, um, then we will be ready to transfer the IANA function. So this process has been underway. The three bodies, the number resources, domain names, and protocol parameters are the three customers of IANA. So each of these three groups, um, empowered, um, elected through an open process, representatives to develop proposals for each of these communities. That all took place last year. Um, all three communities put forth a proposal, and that's now um, being considered um, by a larger community, um, a transition community. And the hope is this discussion, along with some of the discussions about ICANN accountability, will move forward. A final proposal will go forth to the government It'll be accepted, and by the time the contract ends this September, there will be a transition. Um, from Aaron's perspective, and I think anybody believing in the multi-stakeholder um, bodies, a successful transition sort of validates that process. Um, we want to keep the internet open um, and have participation by all of the parties, all of the users of the internet. So how to participate in Aaron, and that's really the reason I'm here, is to get you all excited. Um, how many of you all are policy wonks? How many want to be policy wonks? Um, it's really to, to encourage you to take a look at, at what we do. At some point, some of the policies, if not today, could be of interest and could impact you at some level. So, um, you know, it's really sort of a, a general education. 
we, we do have these meetings. We have a meeting fellowship. Um, we select, we have a fellowship selection committee up to 15 fellows, five from Canada, five from the US, five from the Caribbean for each Aaron meeting. Uh, we pay your way there. Our meetings in the fall are back to back with NANOG, Network, uh, North American Network Operators Group. How many of you have heard of NANOG or ever been to a NANOG meeting? Um, it's three days of technical presentations. Fascinating, to be honest, half of it's like this. Over there. <laughs> um, but if you know you're into that, it's been great networking. They just um, completed their meeting earlier this week and they had over a thousand people out in San Diego. So our fall meeting is two days, Thursday and Friday of that week, NANOGS, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and our fellowship program um, includes your participation and attendance at NANOG too. So if you're interested in seeing what it's all about, I encourage you to submit a um, fellowship application. Yesterday was the closing date for um, applications for our next meeting, which is in Jamaica in April, but it will soon be open for our fall meeting in Dallas in October. Um, we also have a public policy mailing list that's all about policy, a lot of outreach events, and um, other mailing lists. Also, from time to time, on the Aaron website and through mailing list, we'll do a public community consultation on a topic. Um, do you think Aaron should be developing a new routing registry? Things where we're talking about possible new services, um, and we want to gauge whether the community has interest, because bottom line, we are a service organization. Um, so you can participate that way. We have a suggestion process, a formal process. Um, if you don't like something Aaron's doing, not number policy resource related, but other services, or think there is a new service we should be offering. Um, on the website, you can find how to submit a suggestion. It's taken and reviewed by staff, and there's a whole formal process um, for evaluating that. I mentioned the V6 Wiki before. Um, and the guest blog. We're also on social media. And if you are a representative of an Aaron member organization, I would encourage you to please vote in the annual elections. Um, we have about 5,200 members. Each organization gets one vote, doesn't matter what size you are. So with 12 to 15 percent participation, your vote really does count. And these are votes for the Board of Trustees, which sets the direction of Aaron and the Advisory Council. So it's an important way to be involved, and not only to select the members, but also it's a vote for Aaron as a multi-stakeholder open organization. This is um, most of our mailing list. All but the second one Aaron discussed um, are open to everyone. Aaron announces just a broadcast list, which I recommend if you just want to know what's going on, when we're having meetings, what new policies. It's pretty low traffic, but it would keep you informed of new things happening in Aaron. So I would recommend you subscribe to that one. Um, Consultation list. Aaron issued is a list that goes out every day that tells you what resources we've issued, what net blocks, if you're into that and want to keep track. And the Aaron technical discussion list um, is a great place to ask um, fellow members of the community um, about DNS security, anything. It's manned by our technical staff, and it's really sort of an open discussion list. Find us all places here. And again, um, our next meeting, which I invite you all to, is in Jamaica in April. And then we will be in Dallas in October. From time to time, we are other places will be here in Canto 
um, the end of July, Aaron and LACNIC, which is a regional internet registry serving other parts of the Caribbean and Latin America, we typically have a booth together. We'll be presenting on IPv6. Um, we'll be around to talk. And we will have representatives here at the ICANN meeting and hope one day to bring another public policy and members meeting to Puerto Rico. We were here in 2007 and 2011, so it's about time to come back. And those meetings are open. There's no registration fee, so um, I encourage you all to join us. And I think that's it. Um, because the growth and new folks coming onto the internet are going to be coming over IPv6, so you want to be on the whole internet. We don't like to say old and new, because V6 has been around. Um, and I, I think that's, depending on what type of organization you are, I mean, I think that's the biggest selling point. And frankly, for growth, we're out of IPv4 addresses. So if you are a business, you're mobile, you're something, you're going to expand your network, it's going to have to be over IPv6. No, there's, we, there is not a policy in place that currently that asks Aaron to go look at, rec at legacy <coughs> resources to see if they're being used. When an organization comes back to Aaron to request more resources, there is an audit done to make sure they are utilizing up to, I think it's 80% by policy, of their current resources. So at that time, there would be, but otherwise, um, no. Um, there, there's no policy in place asking us to do that. With regard to the transfer market, um, Aaron uh, Community put policy in place several years ago um, about transfers, and we, Aaron created what's called a um, specified transfer listing service. Um, basically trying to facilitate transfers. Um, so organizations um, can, if they want to, but it's not mandatory, can come in and be pre-qualified by Aaron Registration Services staff, which would show what, under current policy, an organization needs and would be allowed to receive. And then we have a service where organizations with extra V4 can list them. And we have a place where a facilitator, a broker, can list their services. So what we're trying to do is um, set up and make it easy for organizations to conduct the transfer, come in, and register the resources. So there is very much an open market. Um, and Aaron has no way to regulate that. But we are trying to encourage folks to come in through the process, the policy process, so at the end of the day, um, the registration of resources will be accurate. So we have no um, say or really knowledge, we have knowledge, of what's going on in the transfer market, the monetary exchange. But obviously, it's heating up. Um, prices are going up. And not only is there a transfer now between organizations, but there is a policy to allow inter-RIR transfers. So right now, the Asia Pacific um, APNIC has a similar policy needs base to get addresses. So there is an inter-RIR transfer <coughs> policy in place so resources can transfer from Aaron to the APNIC region or vice versa. And there is a policy process in place, and that is happening. Um, also, recently, the RIPE NCC Europe Middle East um, instituted a similar inter-RIR transfer policy. So addresses can flow from Aaron region to the RIPE region, and vice versa through a policy. So I think it will be very interesting to see how it develops. And I know our registration services staff has seen a huge increase in the number of transfers that are happening. Thank you for your attention and for um, listening to me in English. And um, I will try next time I'm invited back to at least be able to do part of my presentation in Spanish. That's my goal. Thank you.